So we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody to the, um, hang on, let me find my, yep. Thank you for joining us for the higher education breakout session. Uh, my name is Marjorie Campbell Ringler, and I am professor and chair of the Department of Educational Leadership at East Carolina University. I'm a, also a founding member of the Dudley Flood Center for Equity, Educational Equity and Opportunity. I'm honored to moderate this panel of higher education leaders. Uh, before we start, we do want to remind everyone that we still we will still be following our code of cooperation for this breakout session and encourage everyone to be respectful of everyone joining us today. Please remember to place all questions for the panelists in the Q&A for the Q&A portion towards the end of the, uh, of the panel and interact with each other in the chat. Uh, I do want to thank the staff members from the Public School Forum, Cook Center and the Center for Child and Family Policy. They will be on hand to help us manage the chat and support any tech needs. So with that, we are going to get started. Remember that the goal is to provide you in this session at least um, uh, ideas for three action steps that you will take um, in your broader community after you leave us. And, um, and so we are going to tackle in this session a guiding question which is um, how does addressing racial inequities in K-12 education system contribute to preparing students to achieve post-secondary attainment? And so we are gonna get started with our amazing panel and I'm gonna have the panel members introduce themselves. So I'll just say them in order as I have you on my screen and we'll do quick introductions. Tell us who you are, your county, your position, and then we'll jump right into questions after that. So we'll start with uh, Dion McLaughlin. Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm Dion McLaughlin. I'm the Executive Director of Critical Reflections on Race and Equity Initiative and an Associate Professor at North Carolina Central University. I have, I'm an experienced elementary and high school principal and bilingual, British born and um, with Jamaican parents. Um, my new book is Personalized Principal Leadership Practices, Eight Strategies for Leading Equitable High Achieving Schools. I've presented to Indiana principals, Illinois principals, ASCD Empower, and um, I've also taught anti-racism and effective school practices for all students and for administrators K-12 and developed an equity certificate at North Carolina Central University. Welcome. Welcome. Um, and then we'll have Patricia Harris introduce herself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Trish Harris. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I serve as a director of recruitment in the School of Education at UNC Chapel Hill. I have over 15 years of experience in higher education, um, particularly in college admissions, recruitment, and student access. Um, I am currently a doc student at the University of Georgia, and my research is centered around the lived experience of uh, minority students, particularly African American students at predominantly white institutions. Utilize championing those student stories as a way for us to provide better support um, for those students. And I'm also in the process of writing a book chapter uh, for support for first generation college students. So I am honored to be here and uh, to share my perspective alongside my colleagues um, in this space. Um, and just happy that my, I have the opportunity to have my voice included in this conversation. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And then we'll have uh, Leslie Locklear. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Leslie Locklear. I am a proud member of the Lumbee Coherian and Waccamaw Suwon tribes. I currently work at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, which is located in Robinson County, North Carolina. And I here serve as the student success coordinator, as well as the interim director of the teaching fellows program. And I'm also honored to say that in my community service outreach, I also serve as the co chair for the advisory committee for the North Carolina Native American Youth Organization, which serves American Indian youth in the state of North Carolina, um, who are rising ninth graders and graduating seniors. So honored to be here with you all. Thank you. And last but not least, Angela Davis. Bless you. I am Dr. Angela Davis. And I said this when we all met, I am the Angela Davis, but not that Angela Davis. Uh, but I have been known to put the elephant 
all the way in the middle of the room. I am the Vice President, Chief uh, Talent and Equity Officer for Durham Technical Community College, and I am a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. I see you over there, Doc. Uh, and also a proud member of the Okanichi Band of the Saponi Nation. Uh, you know, just excited to be able to serve two cultures, African-American, Black, uh, and Native American. And so uh, I just show up the way that I show up. I always say I'm not an expert uh, in this work, never profess to be, but I have been engaged in this work since the age of 14 years old. And so I'm just hoping today to be able to learn uh, from each of you on the panel. Uh, and I hope that I'll be able to share something uh, that you'll be able to use at some point in your journey. Thank you, panelists. I am so excited that you're here and I'm looking forward to um, hearing your responses to some questions that we are, I'm going to pose for you. And unfortunately, we will not have the opportunity for each and every person to answer each question. So we'll have two people answer uh, a question and then we'll open it up at the end. So we'll start with the first question. Uh, what are the prominent issues of inequity in K-12 education in your opinion, from the vantage of higher education. And we will have uh, Dion. Why don't you get us started? Okay. Um, so, in terms of the prominent issues, I'd say there are two that I'll talk about um, this afternoon. And one of them is, of course, the underperformance of students of color. And the other is a lack of connection between best practices and actionable change. So, we're all pretty well versed in the data related to um, the underperformance of students of color. Um, there's an overrepresentation of Black and Latinx students and other students of color in dropout rates, in poverty, in um, suspensions and expulsions, but an underrepresentation of students of color in advanced placement and honors courses and in college um, placement. So we've seen those patterns, we're, we're familiar with those patterns and as we um, begin to, um, as we conduct equity audits and consider the environments in our schools, you know, what do we notice, um, particularly in our elementary schools? Um, who are the students who are, are students of color in those um, advanced math classes? And then in the middle schools are our students of color in advanced math classes, which of course affects what they, their trajectory at high school in terms of whether it's advanced placement chemistry or other uh, AP Calc, and then certainly the STEM careers and options for them in courses that might require advanced level math or sciences um, at the post-secondary level. And how are students experiencing our schools? And so, um, you know, they're certainly well-documented in terms of uh, the underperformance of our students of color. I think another prominent issue is just that lack of connection between best practices and actionable change. And so, you know, as academicians, we spend a great deal of time theorizing, researching, um, and to what extent are we partnering with our districts to share the research that we're conducting and ensure that practice is informing our research. And so, making that connection between best practices and actionable change. That really begins with um, critical self-awareness, mm -hmm. self-reflection. And so our families of color don't need to be fixed, rescued, or pitied. Um, and as we look at issues of societal injustice, as, as we look at those issues through the lens of bias, through the lens of uh, racism and the lens of privilege, um, and taking the time to invest in learning about our own racial history and current issues of injustice. So we sort of move through this process of what might be called equity download, sort of spending that time on the racial, um, getting to know our racial autobiographies and learning about racial history and the current issues and then move towards action. So or what could be termed equity execution. And so I think another uh, you know, lens to consider in our work is, you know, what if Calvin was my son, meaning as we are working with students of color, do we consider what uh, how might we interact? How might our work be different if we imagined, if we considered that the students that we're working with were our own sons, our own daughters, our own birth children? And so lastly, I would just say that, you know, in terms of what perpetuates inequity, I think it's not utilizing practices that help students of color to be successful. So when we find out what those best practices are, utilizing those best practices, and I think very quickly listing six for you. Um, so in terms of teachers, practices that are successful for teachers, best practices, one would be leading discussions about 
race, racism, and the positive contributions of African Americans and Latinxes. Um, being dedicated to the success of students, meaning requiring students to do work, being caring, being available to students before school, after school. And I think what's called break it down to the ground, right? Meaning that we are taking highly complex information as teachers and making it accessible to students. So it's clear, it's relevant, um, and everyone get, gets called on. We're familiar with the work of Dr. Geneva Gay, where she talks about the importance of having students of color um, be engaged or part of the classroom discourse. So having those procedures in place, those systems to make sure that everyone is called on, everyone's part of that classroom discourse. And then I'd say the last two are just being passionate about our subject matter. So being cheerful, being update, taking material that may seem boring or uninteresting and making something that is work not seem like work. So students are interested. And I think lastly, maintaining highly structured classroom environments where they're rigorous environments, they're clear expectations, highly organized. So I think in terms of inequities in K-12, I think we are familiar with the underperformance of students uh, of color. And I think making the way that, uh, connecting um, best practices to actionable change. Thank you, thank you. That's um very comprehensive thank you and so um leslie would you like to add um what, what do you feel are um in your opinion prominent issues of inequity in k-12 education from your vantage sure. sure and um i will be very transparent and say i speak from the lens of the american indian community and the american indian student population very particularly southeast american indian student um, population and even more particularly um from my tribe um the lumbee tribe of north carolina and i would say hands down one of the number one issues that we have is that we are largely invisible when it comes to the k-12 through curriculum and in absolutely anything in terms of material that one finds 89 percent of references to american indians in the k-12 12 curriculum across the United States is a pre 1900s context. And so mm -hmm. there is a lot of misinformation that is shared a lot of stereotypes. So it is very hard for me to integrate my people into the curriculum when they are completely invisible to educators and to those around them. And we have found that even in instances where a school has a large American Indian population, educators are coming out of ed prep programs that are continuing to share information that is wrong, that is a appropriative of American Indian culture or just completely misrepresents American Indian culture. So it's almost like not only do we have to overcome the step of being represented, we have to also overcome the step of being completely invisible to people's everyday lives. So it was um, to the point where when I got to college, people were saying, I didn't know American Indians existed. Can I touch you? Can I touch your hair? Do you live in a teepee? And I am so sad to say that my recent research shows that in our urban areas, our American Indian youth are facing the same questions in 2021. So in my opinion, from our perspective and my community, it is that we are completely invisible in the K through 12 curriculum and to the knowledge of many educators. Thank you. Ooh, just need to pause right there. So much to take in. Thank you both. Uh, I We're going to move to the next question. But you remember, this is to spark your thoughts to think about what are you going to take on and what are you going to follow up with? Okay, so the next question. And Angela, we'll, we'll have you go first and then Patricia, you can uh, be next. Uh, what are the most prominent issues of inequities in post-secondary recruitment and retention processes that are contributing to or even exacerbating these inequities that we just talked about? Yes, so I, I'm going to start first by sharing that biases and microaggressions, um, I think, are two key areas that are impacting um, our recruitment and retention processes in post-secondary education. Um, at Durham Tech, we focus a lot on self-reflection and creating space uh, for courageous conversations and having opportunity to uh, talk about those difficult subjects. I called them the nasty words when I first joined Durham Tech six years ago, words like race, racism, you know, uh, prejudice, stereotype, you know, intersectionality. I mean, you start saying these words uh, and they can be very difficult for, pe for people to talk about, but it's important for uh, individuals, educators to discuss their lived experiences. And you heard Dr. Van Walfen talk about this before. Self-reflection is key, peeling back the onion, having space for people to share uh, and being able to 
uh, you know, feel that they are included in these conversations and that those conversations are welcome. That impacts every single thing that each one of us at Durham Tech will do uh, in the recruitment, the onboarding process, not only for students, uh, but also for our employees. And it impacts the entire culture uh, by which we function and operate. So it is so important uh, and key that individuals um, you know, own their own biases and microaggressions, own uh, their own stuff, and how that shows up and impacts uh, the experience of our students before they even set foot on campus, before they access uh, our online platform. What are we doing to uh, make people feel welcome and also to provide uh, that inclusive space for people to see themselves uh, in our classroom and in instruction. We heard Dr. Locklear uh, talk about the fact that, um, you know, for the, for the most part, Native Americans are invisible. Absolutely. I, I can remember having uh, many conversations um, with my daughter's classes. And, you know, this was from elementary school uh, until the time that she was in high school participating, uh, you know, in uh, those Thanksgiving, uh, if you will, presentations and programs. And I, I remember coming dressed in full regalia, having conversations about my personal uh, lived experience and having individuals say, I didn't even know you still existed. And so, you know, we've got to own our stuff. And even as uh, colleagues of color who experience, um, you know, the same issues that our students are experiencing, um, because we, we are our students, right? We are the students that we serve. Uh, we've got to understand that we too have biases. Uh, we too have challenges with microaggressions and colorism. And so we've got to own that so that when we walk into um, our organizations, institutions of higher learning, uh, that we are clearly aware of who we are and how we bring our lived experiences and the impact that those experiences will have uh, on the community that we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Davis. That that was a lot to think about as I'm thinking about how I'm going to frame my answer to this question. But as I listen to my colleagues um, talk about the inequities in, in education in K through 12 and higher education, it prompts this thought that this whole post-secondary verse K through 12 is a false dichotomy, first of all. Right, it is. It should be more integrated. Right, we are interconnected, interrelated, and it should be treated as such because a lot of the same issues in K through 12 then translate over to um, post secondary education, starting with what Dr. Locklear talked about with the lack of representation in the curriculum. Students should have an opportunity and be taught of the curriculum that. Uh, where they're represented in the histories and the stories, where they can imagine, you know, imagine them, sh sh see their place in the world and society and imagine a possibility of their, their own potential, right? So that that's one thing. The other thing I thought about is resources. I'm a first gen um, college student. I like to tell people, I'm from Georgia, from a small town, gay Georgia population, 86 and half of those people are my cousin, right? So I'm thinking about the resources that I had in my high school. There was literally two AP courses and they were taught at the same time. Um, so it was just like the lack of resources, the lack of information. My parents didn't know anything. My parents also couldn't take off time for work to take me on college tours or pay for um, SAT. I remember begging, going to my school counselor, begging for um, waivers so I could take the SAT and then having to figure out how I'm going to get gas money to get to take those tests. So those those are some of the same inequities, the, the lack of information and um, resources that our students don't have access to. And also they don't see themselves not only represented in the teacher workforce, but also school counseling. So academic advising at the K through 12 level is critical and crucial. Oftentimes I'll hear students coming to me saying, oh, well, my counselor told me not to apply to Caroline. They encouraged me to apply to here. This, and, I, and, that, and that is problematic, right? It is so problematic. I always tell students, you know, Demography does not have to define your destiny, especially when there's an intervention involved. So intervention can be a mentorship. It can be one of us here talking to students. It could be education, right? So education definitely was my, my intervention. 
So um, the other thing that I wanted to do is teacher diversity. That's what I do. I'm a, I'm a recruiter. I serve as a director of recruiting for students. So people, people often think it's HR, but I do student admissions and recruitment. So teacher diversity, there's a plethora of, of data that research that shows the impact of having diverse uh, teacher, just one, you know, about how it impacts graduation rate, graduation rates, um, college attainment rates, but yet there's still so many barriers for people to even become educators in our in our state and in our country, right? Um, it currently requires a bachelor's degree, some requires a master's degree, there's no consistency. So all these barriers, all these things continue to perpetuate these um, inequities that we're seeing in our education system. Thank you, thank you so much. So we've talked about what we, um, envision as the issues, uh, the challenges, um, you know, the problems. So let's move on to how, you know, ideas about what we could do about this. And um, we're gonna pose this question to uh, Dr. Locklear and Dr. Davis um, in, in that order. So are there ways in which K-12 educators and post-secondary educators can collaborate to advocate for these changes? I think absolutely. I think one of the things that I had to realize coming out of a ed prep program and then knowing that I am now coming back and serving in a school of education is that there are there is a lot of misinformation that is shared and we almost have to re-educate those that have come through various ed prep programs. And a lot of times what that looks like, particularly here at UNCP um, and our local community is offering a lot of training, a lot of support, a lot of information a lot of re-education when it comes to certain topics. So one of those really big topics that we spend a lot of time talking about, and now I think I'm so excited about, Dr. Floyd shared in our original large session that we are going through a complete curriculum redesign here at UNCP in our School of Education. And the gist of that really is we do not want to produce any more educators that will continue to perpetuate misinformation about any community. So what does it look like to re-educate but also revise our entire curriculum and a critical part of that has been a focus on culture responsive teaching and cultural education. How does it look for an, an teacher to leave us and know that they will go into a school and they will be working with students and they will have the skills to do so. And I think one of the most important things um, that sometimes we don't remember and don't focus on in, in education is that you have to know thyself. You have to have your own cultural competence. And Ladson Billings talks a lot about this. And one of her three key parts of being a cultural responsive teacher is developing and maintaining your own individual cultural competence. 34% of white Americans admit to lying about their race when applying to college. They admitted to lying about being a minority and 48% of those that lied stated that they were Native American because there was new, knew there was no way to track or prove that or they knew they were not going to be asked. So in that situation, how can we work with students to say, know yourself, know your own cultural competence, explore who you are, so that when it comes to situations where they could easily lie, they will be so sure of their own personal identity that when they are in front of diverse students, they can then assist them in building their own positive self-identity. So I think when it comes to working with teachers, it's not only that re-education, but also assuring that those that we are producing now are on the right path and that for the next generation and the next seven generations, we are producing educators that are going to support them and that are going to continue to allow them to develop those positive self identity um, formations within the K through 12 classroom. Excellent. Dr. Davis. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll just say, you know, there's a, there's a great book that, um, the authors are Tia Brown McNair, uh, and there's four other authors, but uh, Becoming a Student Ready College, A New Culture of Leadership for Student Success. Uh, this, this particular book we've read as a college at Durham Tech. And one of the things that I found uh, interesting was the focus, and this was chapter five, the focus um, on demonstrating belief in students. And then also in chapter four, uh, building student readiness through effective partnerships. Now, we've all heard what I'm going to share, and this, this has come out of uh, this particular book, but we've all heard this uh, when we talk about that cross-collaboration between um, K through 12 and uh, higher ed, uh, that students are not well-educated in high school. 
Uh, the problem is K through 12. Uh, the community of origin was not college oriented. Uh, the grade school teachers and middle school teachers did not lay a good foundation. Uh, we have lowered our admission standards. Uh, the international students are culturally unprepared. Too many students require re remediation. Uh, they do not read, uh, they do not understand. And so what we, we find is that there's a very deficit-minded approach uh, to thinking that students of color are not as good or they can't learn the way that other students learn. And so we've got to, um, as Dr. Locklear shared, we've got to produce educators and instructors who have an equity mindset versus a deficit mindset and how they approach instruction in the classroom. And we've also got to do, as it shares uh, in, in this book in chapter four, we have got to leverage our partnerships. We have got to engage and understand that our larger community ecosystem, it includes every system that we could name on this particular call. We've got to engage all systems, not only engage those systems, but ensure that we have a common appreciation for the work and the strengths and the needs of each of those particular partners. We've got to acknowledge those overlapping accountability and stop that blame game of, well, you know, it's the responsibility of K through 12 or it's the responsibility of the college. We've got to, you know, look at that overlapping accountability and work together to create an agreement on infrastructure of how we're going to turn this uh, into a different direction for student success. And we've also got to leverage financial resources and commit to those shared costs. We've got to acknowledge that, hey, this uh, a particular school system may be doing this. And so I need to make sure that I'm engaged in conversations with that school system so that I can leverage cost. And we may be able to work together to create these opportunities for continuous communication in order to see students uh, succeed in both K through 12 and in higher ed. There's a phenomenal illustration in this book and you have to take a look at this. Uh, we call it the leaky buff bucket graphic, uh, but what I think it shows, and we changed it to meet the needs of Durham Tech, but we have to acknowledge that we are talking about a pipeline that starts from the time I mean, we're, we mean cradle to classroom. So we're looking at a pipeline and it is our responsibility, regardless of where we fall in that process, to hold ourselves accountable for working with the child that's in the cradle, all the way to working with the child that's in college and everywhere uh, in between. As a community, that's our responsibility and we have to hold ourselves accountable uh, for participating in that way. Amen. Amen. Do know that this is recorded because we need to go back and play back a lot of this <laughs> because it's so um, powerful, so powerful. We need we need to take it in and really sit with it and decide what we're going to do with this. This is so good. So we're going to move into the last question, and this will be for Dr. McLaughlin and Ms. Harris. Um, you know, we cannot leave the session without talking about all of the uh, backlash that's happening in our education world. So what are some anti-racist strategies that you would recommend educators utilize in addressing the backlash to the systemic changes that are happening in education, such as critical race theory, HB 324, changes to the social studies standards? So um, I, I want to begin by saying I just love the response that Professor Nicole Hannah-Jones gave yesterday, where she talked about demystifying, right? She also talked about educating. And she raised the question, do parents even know what we teach in our schools? And I think that just critical issues that she raised in the discussion yesterday. And so I want to talk with you about the intersectionality between critical race theory, HB 324, and the new social studies standards. And I want, because I think it's so important that we educate ourselves. And I have a disclaimer, and that is that I am not an expert in the social studies standards, but I am, of course, familiar with those standards. So let's talk about um, critical race theory. So what is it? Um, so critical race theory was developed by Latson Billings and um, Tate, and they define critical race theory by listing four tenets. 
And the first tenet is racism is endemic and it's ingrained in American life. Um, the second one is understanding race as property. And the third one is a reinterpretation of ineffective um, civil rights law. And the fourth one is challenging claims of neutrality, objectivity, colorblindness, and meritocracy. And also, of course, the whole notion of storytelling um, is one of the strategies of CRT, and that's used to counter the majority perspective. So our school's teaching critical race theory. Our school's teaching that racism is endemic and ingrained in American life. Our school's teaching about the benefits of whiteness as property. Our school's teaching about a reinterpretation of ineffective civil rights law or challenging claims of neutrality, objectivity, um, colorblindness and a meritocracy is storytelling being utilized to counter the majority perspective. Well, schools are not likely teaching all of the four tenets of critical race theory. Um, and it's also pretty unlikely that the tenets of critical race theory are taught in any sort of concerted way through, throughout a particular school system. But it is plausible that some of the components of CRT are discussed. So, you know, what is what does race is endemic and ingrained in American um, life mean? I mean, it means, of course, that racism, if we define it as a system of advantage based on race, is not just an historical issue. That is a present day reality. Um, it's possible in the course of discussing the American history standards, the behavioral sciences standards and objectives that discussions could occur on the perspectives and experiences of marginalized people in the United States and the presence of racism in those experiences. So when we look at those American history standards, the behavioral sciences objectives, they address the perspectives and the experiences of immigrants, um, minorities, and marginalized people. So AH.B.1.3 point 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 um, talks about critiquing multiple perspectives of American identity in terms of oppression, stereotypes, diversity, di inclusion, and exclusion. AH.B.15 explains how various immigrant experiences have enhanced American identity. So they're very explicitly um, listed here in the standards on um, being able to approach those topics. Um, and 1.6 explains how the experiences of minorities and marginalized people have contributed to American identity. Um, 1.7 explains how slavery, xenophobia, disenfranchisement, and intolerance have affected individual and group perspectives of themselves. And so it is possible to have conversations about racism being endemic um, in American history classrooms and be in keeping with the standards, right? The new, the new history standards. And so are schools teaching about the benefits of whiteness as property? Likely not, right? So it's it's a complex theory. Um, it's, in, it's not entirely intuitive. Um, it's plausible, however, that there could be discussions about the property rights of white people and intersectionality with wars, and that could be discussed in American history. But, um, you know, we know that the US society was based on, on property rights, that um, the role of government is to protect property rights, that um, US history books are replete with examples of battles fought over property rights. And so, and there's that whole connection between property taxes and education. And so the theory of whiteness as property really means that whiteness is viewed as a right and not just a thing. And that property is described as defining as a defining social relationship. Um, so historically owning white identity was protected. So you're familiar with the rule of hypodescent where by just having one drop of black um, blood, you were considered black, uh, black. So whiteness as property was being rendered is also discussed as being rendered transferable or inalienable. And certainly there's many more things we could say about whiteness as property, but for the most part, we realize it's not being discussed in our schools. Um, our school's teaching a reinterpretation of ineffective civil rights laws. Um, CRT theorists believe that uh, following the ruling of Brown v. Um, the Board of Education, that desegregation came at a huge cost to African-American parents, um, well, parents certainly, but to African-American teachers and principals. Black schools were closed. You've got resegregation happening across our country. Schools are more segregated now than they were before deseg. And so white flight has certainly also, um, you know, has increased and as not necessarily so the question is has are the academic is the academic performance of African American students in particular is it better since DSEG? So um, you know certainly a discussion or a series of discussions could take place in American history class about the benefits or perceived failure of desegregation and the Brown v. Board of Education um, ruling. And so um, in terms of American history standard AH 8.3 that certainly could cover turning points in American history which would cover that topic or 3.2, historical empathy and contextualization, certainly that topic as well. Um, and our school's challenging claims of neutrality, objectivity, 
colorblindness or meritocracy. And I need a couple more minutes um, wrapping up. Um, but I would say a discussion on, or a series of discussions that challenge these claims of neutrality, objectivity, colorblindness, and meritocracy could take place in an American history class. Um, certainly discussing any of the objectives related to um, AHB.1, where you're evaluating American identity in terms of perspective change in community, or 1.3, critiquing multiple perspectives. And I know I'm giving you a lot of standards, but I've got one pages for all of this if you need them. So don't feel like you're somehow taking rigorous notes and catching up with all of this. But you know, certainly that is uh, a possibility that any of those could be discussed, any of those topics could be discussed. Certainly there are other standards, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7. I mean, there certainly can be discussed in the context of an American history class. And so I think the other question is, is storytelling being utilized to counter the majority perspective? And again, it's, it's possible that any of the um, objectives that we've discussed um, could be, um, you know, storytelling could occur, meaning that, you know, naming your own reality that as people of color are, are sharing or describing experiences or realities that they could be challenging those concepts of neutrality, objectivity, and meritocracy or colorblindness in sharing our own stories or having that storytelling. And, you know, just the notion that the voices of people of color are critical to opening the understanding of oppression, that these stories are counter to the dominant um, accounts of history, and that these stories can serve as a healing process for marginalized people um, in terms of telling those stories. So I would say, just in summary, um, the schools are not likely to teach all of the four tenets of critical race theory framework. Um, and it's also pretty unlikely that the tenets of critical race theory are being taught in any sort of concerted way throughout a particular school system. But it's plausible that some of the components of CRT are discussed and can be discussed while teaching social studies, um, particularly the American history standards and the American history behavioral sciences objectives. And in keeping, you know, so in keeping with those. And very quickly, in about one minute, um, HB 324, um, we all know it was vetoed, it was passed by the House and Senate, vetoed by um, the governor. Uh, but the key components, and I just want to share these quickly with you, um, of HB 324 um, are respect the dignity of others, acknowledge the right of others to express differing opinions and foster freedom of speech. And public school units will not promote, to so their language on defining to promote is compel students to believe or have a belief in, um, and they list the following concepts that are in subsection C, right? That one, race is superior. So forbidding schools to, to make these, um, to profess or compel students to believe that one race is superior, that an individual solely by virtue of his or her race is oppressive, um, that an individual um, solely by virtue of his or her race bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the race. And the other component of HP 324 is that an individual should um, not be made to feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or other psychological distress um, the U.S. was created by members of particular race to oppress others. Particular privileges or beliefs should be ascribed to a race or an individual because of the individual's race. A meritocracy is inherently racist. Um, the rule of law does not exist, but instead a series of power relationships and struggles among racial groups. And the last part really quick um, of HB 324 is that public school units shall notify DPI and post on the public school unit's website with detailed information available upon request 30 days prior to providing instruction on any of the following, on any of the concepts above, and then section subsection D, um, or contract, contracting with hiring or otherwise engaging speakers, consultants, diversity trainers, other persons for the purpose of discussing concepts described in that section. So being required to post um, with that or notified DPI post on the website if they're applying to have these speakers. And then you've got the big however, right? And that's in subsection C and D. This shall not apply. And this is the critical piece, right? This shall not apply to utilizing materials that are part of a course of instruction. Um, curriculum, instructional program that includes the history of an ethnic group. So you're including the history of an ethnic group. You got a course, C and D do not apply. Um, so you're allowed to do that. This is described in the textbooks, instructional materials, et cetera, impartial discussion of controversial subjects, impartial instruction. And so, you know, you've got that sort of however piece in that last section. And so, I mean, that's sort of that intersectionality piece with HB 324, the history of standard CRT. And lastly, I just wanna say that, um, you know, we're talking about anti-racist stru structures, um, rather strategies. I think it's responding to the backlash by making sure we educate ourselves. So we're familiar with 
um, you know, the, what, what CRT is. We're familiar with HB 324. We're familiar with the social study standards ourselves. And I think then we help our students. We're educating our kids as well, that if we have students in our schools that want to see themselves in the curriculum, they want to learn about their history, students interested in connecting with others from diverse cultural context, that we make space for our students, that we create the opportunity for dialogue and storytelling, for healing, for those counter narratives, and that we don't just sanitize our history, that we do it by having respectful dialogues that are on difficult subjects in history, um, that don't, there's no conflict with HB 324, right? They're, they're, we are including the history standards. And so I think that, you know, we, we introduce an elective course for high school students, middle school students, potentially critical reflections on racial issues in America, the course has been developed, there's curriculum done, you know, I think that or think we that or we encourage students or our communities to adopt the 1619 curriculum in our schools. So there are places for our students to, uh, to, to be educated. And we train our teachers as well. So I think that's part of how what, that we create opportunities for student dialogue on race bias privilege um, that is based in history. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very thorough. Thank you. Ms. Harris, would you like to add to this? Say not really. <laughs> she did a great job and interrogating, like thoroughly interrogating what it means. Cause it's like I asked the question, what are we really talking about here? Are we really talking about CRT? Because I didn't get introduced to CRT until literally my first year of my PDD program. Like I never even heard of it, maybe once or twice in the undergrad, um, in some of my rate critical race um courses and talking about um, racial retentions and that type of stuff. But what are we really talking about? We need to get to the root of that and understanding what are we talking about and how that is materializing and showing up in our education system, in our society, right? And I love um, Dr. Professor Hannah Jones' response yesterday is the fact that we're sitting on this, this panel giving this, this, um, this, this topic space and attention is, is really helping them achieve their, their agenda, their goal, right? They've already given us a playbook. So then they've been very strategic and intentional with how they want to share our information and how that information is being disseminated. And so why can't we just follow the same playbook, right? Like just with more strategy and more intentionality about how we educate ourselves around this topic with you know, going through that law, going through these, um, what the information that's been shared out and making sure we fully understand it so that we can share that with families, and students, when they ask us questions, so maybe having a toolbox or a toolkit that you can send out a PDF or a video that you make yourself that count as short, that you could send out to a family or a parent who's asked an educator or you specifically, like, what is this? And helping them to clearly understand what is going on, what is truly being taught. Another thing that I like talked about, elevating the student voices, giving them choice, right? Nobody, like, did we ask the students? Did we ask them? <laughs> And mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. of the research has shown like with the um, the education, the North Carolina education form, they have these student voices and these student stories. Students are craving for this and for they're asking for this, but we're then making laws that saying that they're not that that they're not right. Mm -hmm. um, and also just again with, with the playbook, the education and the elevating three of the student voices, those are my 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 uh, what I want to share as strategies for helping us um kind of dispelling this and rec um, ratifying this issue or um, providing just information for parents and families who are interested in learning more, right? Not shoving it, asking them to define it. When they ask you, what, I, I don't want my students learning. Could you please define what that means? Could you clarify or help me understand your understanding of CRT? So then you hear their side, you hear their, their narrative, right? And then you can offer a counter narrative that it, of, uh, of information um, based off research and narrative, what, and actually, um, what the theorists meant it to be. So thank you again for that, again, thorough interrogation. I learned a lot <laughs> just listening to you. And I'm like, okay, why am I even talking? But hey, <laughs> I'm so, so thank you for that. Um, I took down some notes as, as well. I can't understand them, but I wrote them down. And I will go back to, to kind of arm myself and create a toolkit um, for when people ask me. And so if you don't mind sharing that one pager with us, I, I would like to include that as a part of my toolkit for educators. Um, yeah. So thank you. I'll put my email in the chat. I'm happy to share that. Yes, wonderful. And we have three minutes and uh, we'd like to take at least one question from, from um, the audience. And perhaps we can, there's four of us, three minutes. So maybe answer it in less than a minute. 
and two of the questions are pretty much uh, related. And it's about uh, recruiting and retaining a high quality, diverse educator workforce for both K-12 and higher ed. So um, what suggestions, ideas, how can we get our diverse uh, educators in, in interested in education? Uh, Dr. Lafleur, want to get us started? We'll do quick, quick, quick. Sure, and then I'm going to toss it to Ms. Harris, who's actually in recruitment. So on the Governor's Drive Task Force, this was one of the main areas that we focused on. And honestly, being aware of the barriers at your institution. So what are the ed prep barriers that we face? Is it the Praxis Core exam? Is it an application fee? Is it that students are not prepared when they come in and can't then pass the Praxis Two licensure exam? What is the barrier? So I think a real honest needs assessment. But then I also think we need to be real honest about education in the state of North Carolina right now would you want to go in education if you were 18 I don't think so so knowing how do we advocate for black and brown students who a lot of times come from low poverty low income backgrounds particularly in my community um it's very hard for me to tell you to become an educator knowing what that financial outcome looks like so I think we as the generation that is trying to bring them in, continue to advocate for legislature and change when it comes to education so that we make this field more desirable. I'm tossing it over to Ms. Harris. Right, 100%, Dr. Locklear. Um, I think elevating the reputation of the educator, education as a field, like one that people want to go into, right? I was telling the story about a long time ago in our in African-American community, being a teacher was a, a educator was uh, um, how, was highly regarded in our community. You went off to college, you came back to your community. That was your way of giving back. We've lost that luster. Um, so uh, we need to, again, amplify and elevate the reputation of the field as, as a whole. Our students need brokers of trust who could go out into community and share this information of what it means and the impact you would make. Um, so it, it's gonna take somebody who's mission-minded and oriented, who's really wanting at this point, giving up everything that's going on. And I one of the things you, you hit on too is the artificial artificial barriers to entry, the test prep. Um, then it's governed by legislation. One 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 year is a 2.7 GPA, the next year is a 3.0. There's no consistency, right? And then when people don't know, there's no clear pathway or understanding for the general public on even how to become an educator in the state. Um, so that right there is also a, a barrier for students, and the funding is a, is a huge one. Why would I pay to go into debt and then go and go into a field where I'm going to be making way less? The, the, the debt, the, the, the return on investment doesn't make sense to a lot of the students, right? Um, so in the School of Education at Carolina, I know one of the new initiatives that we have is DREAM, uh, which is a targeted outreach program for students of color to go into special education or elementary education. And we offer them a substantial amount of funding to pursue an MAT degree, offer them a guaranteed job at DPS um, after they, they um, finish their degree. And it also includes mentorship. So we include the mentorship, the funding. So we utilize, we saw what the issues were, and then we created a program to kind of help mitigate those issues. So by providing them funding, mentor, and a guaranteed job. So it's a partnership with a, a school district, right? So those are some of the things, um, ways that we're trying to combat these issues by applying for these grants. And it took a lot of work, it took us like a year or so to get it done, but we did it. And for the next five years, we'll be able to offer some significant amount of resources for students of color, particularly those interested in special education and elementary. Yes, DPS is Durham Public Schools. Dr. Ringler, I just wanted to add uh, that at Durham Tech, uh, we are trying to break uh, the uh, barriers around separating faculty and staff and looking at ourselves as leaders and, and that we are all educators. And so during that recruitment process, we looked at our data. Uh, we looked and disaggregated that data by race, uh, gender, and age, and then also compared that data to the demographic of the students that we serve. And through that process, we created a talent recruitment plan to address uh, you know, those barriers. And so we have very specific goals that we have set and making sure that we are recruiting uh, employees for the college that look like the individuals that we serve. And so I think uh, to everyone's point, you've got to be intentional. Uh, let your data drive uh, the direction uh, um, and your focus for your recruitment strategy and ensure that you are uh, sort of stepping outside of the box with some of those 
uh, traditional ways of recruitment. We make phone calls to um, our neighboring uh, colleges and universities. Central is one where we're making those phone calls. We're talking to uh, those chairs and those deans asking for candidates who are graduating. And so you gotta take that unconventional approach and be intentional about ensuring uh, that the candidate pool is diverse. Uh, we also have um, bias training for our interview committees uh, that you are required to go through before you go through the hiring process. Uh, and we also look at our what we call the EEO report that takes a look at the demographics of our candidate pool. And that gives us additional data uh, to see, are we creating those diverse candidate pools so that the outcomes of that interviewing process produce a more diverse employee base that looks like the demographic of students that we serve. Thank you. And Dr. McLaughlin, you have your hand up too. <laughs> oh, and you're on mute. No, I, I'm actually, you know, I didn't mean to put a hand up. I was trying to put like a clap or something. Oh. So. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, um, I want to thank the panel for your inspiring words, for your wisdom, for your um, courage to say what needed to be said for higher education uh, people that are here in this session. Um, and so a big hand and I, and we're a little bit over Elizabeth, but um, I think you take the floor now for us. <laughs> well, let me add um, my thanks as well um, for this wonderful conversation and for all of you for being here with us um, to, this afternoon. Um, and to all of the participants, um, not just in this session, but for the last two days. Um, this is something that we look forward to all year, um, and it doesn't disappoint. Um, it's a, a highlight um, of the year, I think, for so many of us um, to listen to your incredible ideas, but also to think about um, the actions that will come from this um, and the work that you do all year um, that we get to learn about and then to work together to build on um, from these conversations. Um, I have uh, notebooks full of notes of things that I want to learn more about and talk with people about um, and, uh, and, and potential partnerships um, that we all have responsibility to build on. So thank you um, so much for all of that. Um, um, and as we discussed at the beginning of um, the day today and also the beginning of this session. Um, the, um, we you know, focused a lot on um, the actions that come from these conversations um, and the um, importance of um, thinking about our, um, all of our actions. Um, there's the evaluation. And, um, and so one, one step in that is certainly think about the graphic organizer. So I've just shared again, um, the link to the graphic organizer um, for everyone to, to think a little bit about um, uh, about your own actions, how this fits your work and how this um, fits um, what comes next. So if you will think a bit about that. Um, and then we also would ask you um, to share some of your thoughts um, with one another and um, then um, um, on, on your social media um, at Color of Education um, so that we can continue to collect those, not just in the conversations that we've recorded today in the notes that we'll take from that, but also in an ongoing conversation online together um, so that we can continue to build on that. And then we wanna once again, thank our Color of Education sponsors for their assistance in making um, this event possible. Uh, and most importantly, again, to all of you, um, this is why we, we do the work for you and are so um, pleased that you were able to join us for these couple of days. Um, thank you again for being a part of this. I'm really grateful.